sit down. Uh, if you don't know yet, uh, we have, you know, I think we've instituted uh, this now, right? That uh, the children go to the children's uh, church now. Is that right? No? Or is it starting next time? Starting next time, okay. I uh, started the announcements already. Okay. So, yeah, starting next time, that's going to happen. Okay. Well, why don't you open your Bibles if you have it with you to uh, the Gospel of Mark? And uh, we're going to be talking about how to be blessed by God. Okay? I mean, I know that last Sunday, what a wonderful time was sent out at the table of the Lord, and we were told by God Himself that God wants us to be blessed by Him. He loves us, and He wants us to be blessed this year. So the question is, how do I get blessed by God? And I want to ask you, first of all, to stand, because the first thing that we need to learn is that we need to give honor to God's Word, okay? I'm going to read from Mark, chapter 11, and start with verse 19. When evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots, Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask, in the original, it's all that you ask. All that you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You may be seated. The big idea this morning is that living by faith is the only sure path to God's blessings in your life. So, the understanding then is that if you want to be blessed in any area of your life, you have then to exercise faith in God by speaking things out in that area of your life. Okay, so I want you right now, if you want to get something out of this this morning, you need to make sure that you have your response cards in front of you, you got a pen and paper, and I want you to start writing down what is the area in your life today that you feel is suffering. You're not being blessed by God in that area of your life. It may be your relationship at home, it may be your finances, it may be your business, it may be your health, it may be you know something that's going on in your mind, in your heart, whatever it is, God wants to bless you this year. And this is something that He wants to do. Okay? And you know, when God wants to do something, what happens? It happens. It happens, right? <laughs> okay, so so you have to choose the area. I mean, I don't, most of you, you know what? It's like, Henry, stop, saying, stop talking about it. I already know. Okay? All right, so I'm going to stop talking about it. But I want you to think of that as we go through this. So Jesus' prescription for a blessed life is this. He says, have faith in God. Okay? Have faith in God. And this, I want to let, let you know, came out of Him cursing a tree. Okay? So... This is strange. God is a strange being, isn't He? Okay? And Jesus exemplified that strangeness of God. So the theologians call Him Holy Other. He's above and beyond us. But here though, when He writes things in His Word, God makes sure that we understand and that there's a purpose for us when we read His Word. So why is a blessed life then dependent on having faith in God? Well, because without faith, two things are impossible. First of all, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says, if you don't start on a basis of faith, God that you don't see, you can't hear, you can't touch, you will never discover God, because God will not be pleased with you. And number two is, without faith, it is impossible to receive God's blessing. Because when we step out in faith, certain things happen in our hearts, certain things happen in our brains, in our souls, that then make it much more likely for us to be blessed by God. So that, because remember that God has a prescription for our lives. You know, Ray has been talking on this, uh, uh, with chapter 6 of Romans today, and there, you know, she was talking about the law. And the law, what is, why was the law given through Moses? It was given as a prescription for life. God said, okay, you're in the desert, you're going to inherit the land, 
you're going to have you know, generations to come. You want to be blessed by me? Here's the prescription. And what happens with the prescription? If you take the prescription, you put it in your pocket, and you never go because you have money, you have you know, you're upset about the copay, you don't like the pharmacist, I mean, whatever it is, different reasons, you don't like what the doctor said, I mean, you put it in your pocket, and what happens? Well, you ain't going to get any better, okay? So that's exactly what we're talking about here today, and God has not changed over the thousands of years, it's still the same. So how do you receive the blessings God plans for your life? The occasion is that of the cursing of the fruitless fig tree. Jesus' recommendations are this, have faith in God. Jesus says, don't be impressed that I was able, just by mere words, to curse this tree and dry it up overnight. Do not be impressed by that, because you can do the same thing. He said, the same power that I have by, by the words of my mouth, you have the same power by the words of your mouth. Okay, you need to... Get that into your head and understand that this is the exact same thing. Jesus came for two reasons. One, to be the way, and number two, to show us the way. And the way of blessedness is having the power in you, through the Holy Spirit, to bless your own life and bless others by your mouth, by the words that come out of your mouth, that come with authority, that come with the grace of God. So, I accomplished it by the power of my words, Jesus says. I did not accomplish by any other power. Not because I'm the Son of God, the only begotten, one and only Jesus Christ there is. Not because I have that power, yes, but I did it as a human being to show you that you can also do the same thing. And didn't Peter do the same thing? Remember one of the first miracles? He says, I don't have money to give you, the beggar right at the temple gates. I don't have, but what I have here is I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. The first step of living by faith. Is to have faith in God. <coughs> Who is the object of your faith today? We live in Southern California in the United States of America. Where good work, good honest effort brings results, right? This is the work ethic, right? This is the German, the Northern European work ethic that if you work hard, everything will fall in place, right? And some of you are here today saying, well, it ain't working in that area of my life. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm pulling my hair out because it's not working. Why is it not working? Because it's not God's blessings. You cannot work into God's blessings. You cannot do that. God said, you know, if that was the way you had to do it, then I wouldn't have said my son. If you could do that as human beings, if you can figure it out, go up to heaven, bring God down, go into hell, shut down hell and come up. We don't need Jesus Christ. But we do need Jesus Christ, that's why He came. And therefore, who is the object of your faith? Who do you base your confidence in? Who is the person that you trust to get you out of your problems? To whom do you run for help? Jesus says, run to God. Trust in God. Have confidence in God. Trust His plans for your life. Who makes the final decision in your life? On your vacation, on your career? How did you decide those things? How do you respond to God's messenger? Specifically this morning, how do you respond to God's messenger? when you hear God's plans for your life. Like Virgin Mary, we talked about her last, last uh, month, right? Her response to Angel Gabriel, the messenger of God was, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may it be to me as you have said, then the angel left her. Are you willing to take the risks this young Virgin Mary of Nazareth took that day? Believers throughout the ages of Christianity have been calling Mary blessed. She is the most blessed. That's what the angel said. You will be blessed among all women. And that's exactly what's happened. In fact, she is so blessed and she's such a blessing to so many people because of her life and her, her life with Christ and her life because of Christ that some people even 
have venerated to the point of being God. But that morning, that day, Mary had to make a choice. Was it going to be the wisdom of Nazareth, the community of Nazareth, how her parents brought her up, you know, how the, the rabbi talked to her about, about life and everything else, or was she going to take a chance with what this angel coming in and frightening her and changing, you know, changing everything upside down? Was it, it was going to be this way or the other way? But she decided to say, let it be done to me as you have said. That takes faith. But she spoke it with her own words. See, you and I have authority over what comes out of our mouths. And when that authority is used in the proper time, in the proper way, under the direction of the Holy Spirit that is inside you, you are blessed by God. And you become a blessing to others. Would you like to receive God's blessings? The blessings that He has in store for you. God has sent me as His messenger this morning to give you this message. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Note that Jesus recommended His disciples to have faith in God. Not faith in faith. Not faith in any God, but faith in a very specific, special God. With a big G. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have to say all three names. Because in every generation of, you know, Abraham, you know, Isaac and Jacob, there's other lines that are coming up, other religions coming up. Today we have other smaller gods with a small g. And one of them is the mind, the human mind. Wow. It's a miracle. It's an amazing thing. And we magnify those who have brilliant minds. Remember, the, there was even a movie about the beautiful mind. And we worship. That's kind of the, the culture of the day. We worship those who are brilliant. Brilliant in business. Brilliant in engineering. They do those, all these feats of engineering. I mean, we've never seen this before. Glass kind of... A cathedral going all the way up to the sky, so as far as the eye can see. It used to be that America was that brilliant mind. Now it's everywhere else in the world. The biggest building and the, the biggest and most wonderful new discoveries. And it's all over the world. Knowledge is being continuously going up. And it's very easy for us to say, you know what? All I need is a good mind, a good training, a good education. All I need is some good advisors, whether it's legal or whether it's you know, whether it's business, whether it's, it's uh, psychology, psychiatry, whatever it is, all I need is some brilliant mind to just tell me what to do and everything will fall in place. Let me tell you, I would rather believe in the God who created the human mind than those that have that gift. People at Abraham's time worshipped the fertility gods of Canaan. They sacrificed to them and paid homage to them. Sometimes even to their own firstborns would be sacrificed. All that they have, they can have grace. They can be blessed in their fields, blessed in the land, blessed so that whatever they, they sowed, they would have har harvest so they would not starve to death. And that the enemy would not come and, and, and they would succumb to pestilence or the enemy or anything else. And they would sacrifice the gods and goddesses, the fertility gods of Baal, the Bible says. Yet Abraham did not trust in the fertility gods and goddesses. He trusted in a God whom he could not see, in a God whom he could not hear, in a God whom he could not touch. And so Abraham was blessed tremendously. Do you ever... Have you ever heard of any of the uh, Edomites, <laughs> the Girgashites, and the, all the Ayanites in the land? They don't exist. They're done for. Because that's what leads, you know, if you don't make the right decision this morning on this area of your life, whatever that area is, you will go the same way because without God, there is no blessing. Without pleasing God, there is no blessing. Without faith in what God can do for you, there is no blessing. What were the disciples amazed by? Mark 
underlines it. You probably won't see it in your Bible. But it's underlined. He says, verse 14, he says, Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And here's where Mark is putting an underline. And his disciples heard him. What does this mean? Mark is very simple. <laughs> it's all about and Jesus did this, and Jesus, Jesus did that, and he did that. It was all action, 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 action. It's written for the Romans. People of action, people that are in charge. But here, the underlines heard him. They heard him with their own ears. They heard him curse the tree, the poor tree, unsuspected tree. I mean, what, what is going on? They were impressed with Jesus' power to cause a healthy tree to dry up overnight just by commanding it. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of power? To dry up the problem in your life, the thing that refuses to go away? Well, you have that power. You have that power to do it. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. It's on your lips. This is called extreme faith. It's not the usual variety of faith that you see in Christianity today. It's the extreme faith, above the ordinary, on the edge, action-driven, hold on to your seat. Am I scaring you? What do I mean by extreme? Not extreme in the sense of getting high or becoming excited and being living dangerously, just like the extreme sports of the day. I'm just talking about living way above the average Christian standards. It takes extreme faith, like that of Abraham, who believed in the God who gives life to the dead and summons things that are not in existence as if they already are in existence. <laughs> you know, those two definitions of God just floor me. There's the God of Isaiah. And eye has not has seen, and ear has not heard. The human mind has not conceived a God like you who works for those. God is the worker, folks. He's your worker. How about you hire workers? Well, the best worker you have is God. <laughs> so the question is, is He employed by you? Is He being used by you in your life, in your, in your family, in your walk, in your area of, of ministry, whatever God is, wants to be? This is the amazing God that we're talking about. So between that and the God who gives life to the dead and summons those things that are not in existence, into existence, that's the God that we serve. That's the God that is far above any other God that human minds have conceived and worshipped. It says, though, that in the midst of all that, waiting on God. That's the key. Are you waiting on God? Are you able to wait on God? Here's what it says in Romans 4, 20 through 20. It says, Yet Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he has promised. When God promises something, you be sure that he'll deliver. There is no such thing as I promise, but I'm not going to deliver. <coughs> that is not who God is. So living way above the average Christian standards is perceiving the invisible. This is what faith does. It gives you eyes that you can see invisible things. It's attending the impossible. It gives you confidence. It gives you this power, this conviction. You can attempt the impossible. It gives you the guts to tackle the immovable. Have you ever tried to move walls, move people's opinions of you, move the people's hearts? It's resisting the unstoppable, it's confronting the terrifying. What fear is in your life that is managing your life? The fear of failure, the fear that you're not going to make it, the fear that there's not enough money, the fear that there's not enough love, whatever that fear is, the faith that God wants to bless you because He loves you. And the faith that you can move mountains with your mouth can change all that. 
God is looking for a few more Abrahams, a few more Moseses and Davids and Daniels, Elijahs and Elishas, a few more Deborahs, a few more Marys, a few more Magdalenes. People like you and me who want to break away from the crowd and discover how awesome God is. I don't know about you, but I want a lot of God. Not just a little basket, not just a little <laughs> teaspoon. I want the whole bottle. <laughs> I want to see all of God's power, don't you? I want to go all the way with God. I want people in Pasadena to realize that God is above and beyond anything they can imagine. And that there's nothing that is impossible for Him. There's a difference between Genesis 4 and Genesis 5. You may not have noticed it. But there's the genealogy of the godly line and there's the genealogy of the ungodly line. The sons of God and the sons of men. There's no ages or years in Cain's genealogy. Remember who Cain was? He was the first murderer. Some people believe that he murdered one third of the world's population. Talking about, you know, Stalin and Hitler, well, Cain was above the other. <laughs> and yet, we don't hear about him anymore. His genealogy ended with a flood. Why? Because they all disappear. Why? Because God wants to illustrate the life of evil and selfishness is short and it doesn't last. Evil doesn't pay. It amounts to nothing because it is not pleasing to God. Why does evil not please to God? Because it is not based on faith. It is it's more based on brawn and brains. My own hands. It's my own brains. My own creativity. My own, my own, my own. Without faith, no matter how good and moral your life is today, it will not matter. No one will care whether you live or die, except your heirs and their lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> the disciples were impressed because Jesus had a need for a snack. I'm glad he only had a need for a snack, not a full meal. <laughs> so he approached this beautiful, vibrant fig tree at the edge of town. Probably somebody ate the fig and just threw it on the ground and just sprouted and just wild and just, you know, it was there. It was full of leaves. Some people believe that it wasn't even the time for the figs to arrive. And yet Jesus expected that tree to deliver because he was hungry. So my question to you is, how much do you expect to solve the problem that you have? How much do you expect to see the blessings of God in that area? I mean, this is, are you unreasonable? Jesus was unreasonable. I mean, God says to, to you, you can speak out unreasonable things. People with their right mind don't ask a fig tree to provide figs on the moment when it's not fig season, okay? But Jesus... The one that created the universe, created the fig tree, created the seeds, said, I want figs because I'm hungry. I don't care whether you're delivering or not. And if you're not going to deliver, then you will never deliver anything forever. I mean, that's your Lord and your Savior. He is the wisdom of the ages. And He's telling you that with faith in God, you can demand your problem to be solved. And it will be solved. It has no power over you. It has no right of its own. The thing that I want to end with this morning is this, that we need to avoid ignorance and indifference. Are the two things that eat up the power of God in you. Ignorance and indifference. Ignorance is not knowing that you have this power. Satan is, <clears throat> is so scared 
of a church that's united, so scared of people, Christians, who know the rules of engagement. He's so scared of healings. He's so scared of miracles because he will be so exposed that he's a fake. And therefore, he wants us to be ignorant of the most important power that we have in our life, the power of faith, the power to move mountains. What Jesus is saying to us this morning is this, that if we have faith in God, our words will be powerful and convincing. Your words will be powerful and convincing. When you speak to God, and you speak out about your family in prayer. You speak out that I want my son to be blessed. I want my daughter to be blessed. I want my daughter to find the right husband, not the wrong husband. I want my son to find the right job, not the wrong job. I don't want him to be enslaved in drugs. I don't want to... I mean, some of you have to tell yourselves and tell the world around you that this illness, this ransacking of generations will stop with my generation because I will speak it out. There's not going to be any more of this for the next generation. Enough is enough. Are you willing to speak the words of faith? Because they are in your mouth. God is not calling you and me to curse trees, but to move mountains. To prepare the way for God into your home, into your neighborhood, into your work environment, into your troubled past, your most difficult challenge, to flatten the hills and widen the roads so that God's righteousness will march in like a flood. Now watch this. The ancient prophet called it out 700 years before Christ came. His name was Isaiah. He said, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for Him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Wow. The Romans thought that they were it. <laughs> the empire to end all empires. One major reason why they're able to have an empire of the, of the then known world, it was the discovery of the arch. How do you make a bridge? You need an arch. <laughs> without an arch, there is no bridge. And without a bridge, there are no roads. 700 years earlier, Isaiah spoke it out. And it happened. And the Romans thought they did it because they were smart, they had brains and power, and therefore they would just conquer the world and we have the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, to reign all over civilized people. But God had a different plan. It was so that the gospel would have the roads so that people would walk from one town to another and spread the good news of salvation so that Jesus Christ, who was little known, he never wrote a book, he never published anything. <laughs> he never had any telephones, any, any telegrams, any cars, any jets, nothing like that. And within 400 years, 300 years or less, the Roman Empire became a Christian empire because of the roads, because of the saying of one servant of God, little known Jewish servant, 700 years earlier. I want to live by extreme faith. There is no other way to live. I want my life to matter. I want to measure my life with how much I have contributed to the life of others, not how much I have earned or amassed to make a name for myself. What about you? Here's the bottom line. The word Paul writes in the 10th chapter of Romans, the word is near you. It's in your mouth. And in your heart, that is the word of faith we're proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. 
What that means, folks, is that when you use your mouth and your heart, you gain righteousness with God. Wow. And before that, he explains, you know, don't say in your heart, who's going to go up to heaven, who's going to go down to hell. No, that's already done. Christ did that. You don't do that. It's God who does the work. You are the one that waits on Him. And then when you wait and see what's happening, then you say, I believe. I want to be a Christian. Lord, forgive my sins. And your sins are forgiven. Lord, I want to enter into your kingdom. And you enter into God's kingdom. Lord, I want to impact this world around me. And you will impact the world around you. Starting with your own family. If we have faith in God, our prayers will be powerful and effective, says James. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Not just your words, but also your prayers are effective. If we are saved by the word of our mouth, why would we think we can live by our own strength and resources? Don't panic and try to grab onto a seat. You know, it's like a person that panics in the, one of those rides in, in Magic Mountain, you know. Oh! So just by, by holding on to your seat, you're not going to fly off. I mean, that's... No. You're already, you're already set in, okay? It's not your power that's holding you there. It's the centrifugal force that's holding you there. It's not anything that you can do. It's, you know how much power it takes, how many Gs it takes for you to be able to hold on and not fall? I mean, it's foolishness, isn't it? But that's our immediate reaction is that. And God says, if we have faith in God, trust in Him, our prayers will be powerful and effective. And it all stands or falls on faith. I want to give you a couple of minutes to respond. I want you to make a decision right now. Lord, I want your blessing for this area of my life. I want you to name it. Name that area. Don't just, Lord, I want your blessing in my life. Well, I, how would you ever know that God has blessed your life? Unless He comes and gives you a ton of of money, you know, just unloads a truck of money in you. I mean, I'm not sure that will be a blessing for some of you, probably be first, but ask for specific things in a specific area of your life as I asked you before. Would you do that right now? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I want to be able to speak this out in this area of my life. If you have any other prayer requests, please write them down. We're going to be uh, <clears throat> taking an offering in a couple of minutes. You can put the uh, response card into the offering plate. I don't want the ushers to wait. We're going to be uh, doing this from now on. Have a couple of minutes before the offering to give you some time to prepare, but also <clears throat> to speak to you about giving. continue to worship and offering to God and celebrating what He's done for us. We're going to have a chance to do that in a couple of minutes, but have you ever had a preacher or somebody ask you to give and it just doesn't make sense? Have you ever felt like God is asking, asking for your very last penny? Especially now that we're having such a now we call the Great Recession. Everybody's uh, clamoring down. 
I know I have many times felt the same way. The reality is that often giving doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up or even seem scary sometimes. It's even uh, tougher when you realize that God has asked you to give the first 10%. That's what tithes are all about. It's the first 10% that we give to God. And uh, a lot of times I'm thinking, well, if I give the first 10%, then what's going to happen at the end of the month? There's a story in 1 Kings 17 about uh, Elijah the prophet and he was going to ministry and uh, he uh, visited this town and he saw this woman out gathering sticks for a fire and he asked her to give him some food to eat and she said, you know, I know you're a man of God but I'm just gathering some sticks, we have the last part of the the flour and the oil, and me and my child will just eat and then we'll die of starvation because there's nothing more. But Elijah explained that if she would give her first portion to God's work, God would supply all of her needs. I'm sure that was scary, but the woman decided to be obedient and gave the food to Elijah first. She gave to God's work first and then took for herself and that's God's design but God's promise was true. From that day forward her oil and flour never ran out, they were always enough. God met her needs, He blessed her and He promises to bless us too. God promises to meet our needs if we are faithful and obedient to give to Him even when it doesn't make sense. There are times it will be scary, and it won't make sense, but God is not asking us to make sense of it all, just to be obedient. Will you give when it doesn't make sense? You want to see God provide for you in amazing ways? Today is your opportunity to begin that journey. Let's pray. Father, we trust you, Lord, with your ways. You are always and not always intuitive to us, Father. Father, we have been stretched as a nation, Lord.